And here we go. Woo, it's the next morning. Uh, the dog is very rambunctious today, so I brought over several toys. Eesh, he got stuck in the microphone cord. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, he's been having to sit around while I make all these videos, so he has a little pent-up energy. Here, dog. We don't have a name for him. All right, I'll save this one. Okay. He was running around like crazy a minute ago because, like all dogs, he uh, patrols the house constantly hoping that someone has dropped something they didn't mean to drop. And he got lucky. This marker pen now has teeth marks in it. But I was able to rescue it before he uh, destroyed it. Okay, uh, so this morning will be the, uh, oh yeah, the fourth diagram, all right? Uh, oh, that sounds like some sort of Alfred Hitchcock movie, the fourth diagram. Sorry, I hit the mic, I hit the tripod for the camera with the tennis ball I just threw. And the bottom left is the most complicated one to understand. Bit of an irony since it's just a line, but like the uh, like two of the other ones we've already done, this one's going to have PY and dollars per FX because PY off of the one over there on the right and dollars per FX over the one up there at the top. Because uh, remember, it has to line up the the ones that it's it's next to. You have to have the same vertical axis and over top of each other the same horizontal axis. And this one's going to show the trade balance. All right. Uh, now, unlike the model I was showing you the other day that I got from some, you know, from a textbook uh, with these four diagrams, let me show you that again. Here it is. I got the original idea for it when I used to teach from this book. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong chapter. There it is. All right, got the original idea from that right there. But what he assumed was that in the long run, we always end up with balanced trade, which of course we know is not true. Uh, so uh, this one's gonna have the trade down here, but there's no assumption it will be balanced. However, there is a line, let's see. I, mean, I was laying in bed last night trying to decide how to approach this one, because it is the most complicated and it's helpful if I really, if I really get uh, do a good job here, it's gonna really help you down the road. Um, I believe I'm just going to draw the line first. And I want to make it obvious as I go along why it is that this line represents all the points where trade would be balanced for the United States. For example, let's just pick one out here. Under the particular circumstances uh, modeled by this graph right here, we're operating on the assumption that if you're on the line, trade is balanced, and so that's our first point. We'll just say trade's balanced there. Ah. Now, uh, let's see. What if, oh, I know what I should do. I know what I should do. Imports and exports are a function of. All right, imports, I'm gonna use a red and green here. Imports are a function of the US price level, the exchange rate in the US level of GDP, real GDP, not just the nominal. Um, and then exports are a function of the U.S. price level and of the exchange rate. Uh, so it's like this. When are we going to sell more stuff? When our prices, uh, are the, the own prices of stuff, like, have I got anything American in here? Ah! That seems awful American, doesn't it? Uh, 100 bucks. Let's say it's 100 bucks, right? So some... European uh, tourist comes and visits the stockyards and decides to buy a, a hat for themselves. And that would count as an export. Um, then would this hat be more likely to be sold if it were $100 or $50? Or 50 bucks, right? So, even not thinking about the exchange rate, even not thinking if we hold the exchange rate constant for the moment, if we say, well, whatever a dollar is in their currency, regardless of that, 
the cheaper this is in dollars, the more likely it is to be sold. All right? So uh, we're gonna, I'm going to put a negative sign there. When U.S. prices go up, U.S. exports go down. When U.S. prices go down, U.S. exports go up. Negative, of course, means opposite direction. Now, what about this variable right here? Because they had to get their dollars in the first place, right? They had to take their currency and trade it for dollars. Uh, so dollars per unit of the foreign currency. Let's see now. If that goes up, that means a dollar depreciation, right? Uh, if this goes up, it's more and more dollars to buy unit of the foreign currency. Therefore, that foreign currency is more valuable. So if this number goes up, then the hat becomes cheaper. When that number goes up, then for every one of my units of foreign currency, I got more dollars. I got more dollars. When this number goes up, it is a dollar depreciation because it's more dollars per unit of the foreign currency. So it costs more dollars to buy a unit of the foreign currency. And conversely, for one unit of the foreign currency, I get more dollars. Um, now, let's see. So that's U.S. exports. What would also be very important there would be the incomes of the uh, of those foreigners, but we're not going to bother with that. We are going to bother. Let me put my hat back. Uh, yeah, I don't need this now. Uh, the uh, we are going to bother with U.S. income, but we're not going to bother up here. But again, it would be logical for there to be another Y up here, but the Y for the foreigners, not for us, because they, you know how high their incomes are makes a difference on whether or not they buy a lot of American crap while they're here or not. All right. What about imports? What about when we buy stuff from other countries? Well, the higher our prices are, the more likely I'm going to be, well, I'll just buy an Australian hat instead. Uh, ooh, Melanie has one of those uh, Australian looking hats, but I don't want to get up and walk in the other room and get it. So rather than buy the uh, American, I wonder if it's made in America. Let's see here. It's made in Texas, not just America. So really, that mean, means it's even more American than, than usual. Um, okay, so uh, if, if the price of that hat goes up, I am induced to buy a hat from another country instead. Maybe I'll just get a sombrero. Screw the American hat, it's too expensive. So U.S. prices go up, U.S. imports go up. Now if this number goes up, that means it becomes increasingly expensive to buy a unit of the foreign currency I need. Uh, as the dollar, as this number goes up, the dollar depreciates, and so it's gonna cost me more and more dollars to buy a peso to buy that sombrero. So, as that number goes up, uh, he's got this little tiny piece of cloth he wants me to fight for, and I don't wanna pull his hair, but I'm gonna. If you quit, quit messing around, I'm gonna. Uh, all right. Uh, then uh, as this number goes up, then the dollar has depreciated. It takes more and more dollars to buy a peso. And therefore, for all intents and purposes, that sombrero got more expensive. So we're not going to buy as many. This goes up, imports go down. Uh, see, that's all I got to work with. Looks like he has a bow tie. He's standing there right now, very expectantly. Oh, he's not fooled. I'll bet he could, whoa, he caught it, good job. Um, except now that was like really quick when you got back here. What about U.S. income? The higher U.S. incomes are, the more we can afford to buy foreign stuff. And by the way, of these three factors, this is actually the one that is the most powerful. This is actually the one that causes the most fluctuations in M, not the other two. Uh, and most of your neoclassical analyses focus just on the other two. It doesn't even talk about this one. When in fact, their own research suggests that this is the far more important factor than the other two, fluctuations in income. All right, uh, so given that, all right, given those two functions right here, uh, and notice we've got all three of those variables here. Price is right here, income is right here, and uh, the exchange rate is right there. So we've got them all there. So let's say that this first point here satisfies the condition that trade is balanced. What would happen, let's see. Yeah, let's do that first. Let's, uh, let's just move the exchange rate first, all right? Uh, let's have a dollar depreciation. Oops, I started to write pound. Oh, <laughs> I'm an idiot. I already got a sub-zero. Okay. Everything is the same as it was back here. Let's call that point A. And guess what I'm going to call this one? Point B. Uh, let's say that everything is the same. Whoa, that's close. You didn't find that one. 
Uh, everything is the same between these two situations except the dollar depreciated, okay? The dollar depreciated, more dollars per unit of the foreign currency. So we had balance trade at A. I wonder if we've got a trade surplus or a trade deficit at B. Well, let's have a look. Let's see, if this number goes up, then we export more and we import less. Trade surplus. So if we are to the right of or below, which is the same thing, this line, the U.S. will have a trade surplus. And how do I know that? Uh, and, 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 and I emphasize this throughout this course. I don't have that memorized. I sat there and worked. I don't have this memorized. I know it's just logical. Well, you know, I, I've taught it so many times. But, but this, I could not remember. I could not have told you off the top of my head whether above was the trade surplus or below was the trade surplus. And that's the state you need to be in. You need to be thinking, well, let's see. I've got all the tools right here. I, I can figure it out. Uh, and sure enough, if trade is balanced on the line, and the dollar then depreciates, the dollar is now cheaper than it was before, then, okay, that number goes up, this number goes up, that number goes up, this number goes down. Cool, U.S. trade surplus. If, if X equaled M here, but X is bigger and M is smaller there, trade surplus. All right. Now, <clears throat> Let's do it a slightly different way when we go, uh, I want to give you a slightly different example on the other side of the curve. On the other side of the curve, let's have U.S. GDP rise. Well, I wish I hadn't, oh, started to say I wish I hadn't drawn my A right there. Hey, I got an eraser. What have you got, Doug? Piece of paper, all right. P Y sub 1. Let's say instead of going from A to B, we went from A to C. And this time the exchange rate stayed the same, but the U.S. economy expanded. <clears throat> the U.S. economy expanded here. Now, I've got P and Y separated out up here. And that would cause a real problem if it turned out that P had an effect in one direction and Y had an effect in the other direction, because then we'd always have to figure out every time, geez, which one moved more. But fortunately, that's not the case. They work in the same direction. So check this out. Um, if, if P times Y goes up, and doesn't matter whether it's all P or all Y or half of each or whatever, it's gonna have the same impact. If P times Y goes up, then imports are gonna rise. If US GDP goes up, we're gonna buy more stuff. And if U.S. prices are going up, we're going to buy more foreign stuff as well, right? So that, that's, going to make us, that's going to make us buy more of everything, including foreign stuff. And that's going to make us specifically prefer foreign stuff. And then up here, if PY goes up, if any portion of that was just price, our goods and services are now less attractive to foreigners because that hat went from $50 to $100. Uh, so as a consequence then, U.S. trade deficit. And it doesn't matter, what I'm trying to point out at this point is, it doesn't matter whether the movement away from A was caused by the exchange rate moving or by PY moving. Uh, either way, when you're pulled away from the line, below is going to be a trade surplus and above is going to be a trade deficit. Uh, let me do another example, but, uh, but I'll, I'll switch it around. Uh, I'll, I'll end up above the line because of the exchange rate and below the line because of PY. Because again, this is the most complicated of the, uh, of the graphs, and so more examples is not a bad thing. And we actually haven't even got to the complicated part yet. And I haven't told you why it's positively sloped yet. I know that uh, I'm going to get to that in a minute, but I think this will be actually helpful to start the way we have with just some examples about what happens when you move away from the values that put you on the curve. Okay, X equals M, by definition. If you're on the line, by definition, X equals M. That's how that line is drawn. That line is drawn by showing all the combinations of X and M that give us uh, X equals M, right? Or that give us zero. Oh, man! I left the frickin' uh, air conditioner on again. I'm going to hope that the first part of that wasn't too bad. 
because <sighs> I don't want to start that again. All right, let's see here. I still, I've got so many videos still to make. Um, if it is, I'll, I'll pull out. And last time it wasn't. I, I checked the last time, and, it, and, and the sound wasn't too bad. Uh, but anyway, so uh, let's see. Back to this. All right, so I want to move off the line uh, above by changing the exchange rate. Yeah, that'll work. That'll work. Okay, so let's stay. Before I raised... PY. This time, let's lower dollars per FX to sub 1. And let me label this as A. Guess what I'm going to do for this one? B. And now, let's see what's happened. The dollar A appreciated. All right? The dollar A appreciated. The dollar is more valuable. Well, what happens when this, when this goes down? When this goes down, this goes down because the plus sign means same direction. They move in the same direction. When the dollar A appreciates, it's harder to sell our stuff to foreigners. On the other hand, when this goes down, this goes up. When the uh, yeah, when the dollar A appreciates, it's cheaper to buy foreign stuff because it's cheaper to buy their currencies. So, U.S. trade deficit, just as we had before, U.S. trade deficit. So it doesn't matter whether you move off the line by raising PY or by lowering dollars for FX, it is equally logical that we end up with a trade deficit. And now, uh, let's see, I want to lower GDP over here, right? So let's lower it quite a bit just to get out of the way of the other stuff. All right, so there's point C. Now, uh, would this be a U.S. trade deficit or surplus if U.S. GDP contracted like that? Well, let's have a look. If P falls, then, you know, remember, X equals M here at A. At C, M, if this goes down, then this goes down, right? If uh, our prices go down in the U.S., then we don't want to buy foreign stuff right? because we've got cheap stuff here in the U.S. So if this goes down, this goes down. So that indicates that imports will have fallen from being equal to X to being lower than X, which means a trade surplus. If this goes down, we don't have as much money anymore. So we can't buy as many imports. So same thing. And then last, if this goes down, it's actually easier to export. If the own price of those goods goes down, then it's easier to sell them. So, both of those lead to the conclusion, U.S. trade surplus. So it doesn't matter whether you uh, lay it out as moving off the line because of a movement in the exchange rate or in PY, you get the same answer. All right, why does it look like that? Why is it a positively sloped line? I'll tell you. All right, let's just pick a point out here. Man, I love this stuff. And let's say that at that point, um, X sub zero is equal to M sub zero, right? Sub zero corresponding to the values created for imports and exports by these two values right here. So, um, so at that point, uh, we, we looked around on a graph and we found, aha, here's a point where imports will be equal to exports, right? So th that's where we have a trade balance. Um, now, you have to ask yourself, what if PY went up? What if PY rose? Um, what would be the corresponding exchange rate at which PY sub 1 is balanced trade? Right? So if this rises, then what would this have to do for it to still be balanced trade? Let me say it again. If this rises, what does this have to do for it to still be balanced trade? And notice here, We're either going to end up with a positively sloped function, which is what we're going to end up with, or a negatively sloped function. If we discovered that when PY sub 1 goes up, this has to move to the left, we'd have a negatively sloped function. If we discovered that when this goes up, in order to maintain balanced trade, this must also go up, we have a positively sloped function. 
So let's think about it. Uh, at PY sub 1, um, would the U.S. tend to have a trade surplus or deficit? We all know the answer from having just done it a moment ago, but let's work through the logic once again. Uh, if PY goes up, then imports are going to rise and exports will fall. So we have a trade deficit up here. So when this happened, oh, well, let me mark that. Induces U.S. trade deficit. All right, so if that happens, that's going to lead to a U.S. If that's the only thing that happens now, we just go from here to here, we have a U.S. trade deficit. But we're wanting to trace out all the points that give a U.S. trade balance. So now we're going to ask the question, uh, which direction would this have to go to offset this, to offset this? And the answer is to the right. The dollar would have to depreciate because if, the, if, if this number got bigger, then imports would fall and exports would rise. So it's some positively sloped line. I'm sorry, it's, a, it's some number out, out to the right of dollars per FX Uh, sub zero. Balance trade foreign exchange rate. And here, x sub one is equal to m sub one. They're not the same import and export numbers necessarily, right? They're not the same numbers. Uh, this might be, you know, half a trillion and 20 trillion or whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, but it is the case in both instances that the imports and exports are equal, all right? Okay, number of things you got to bear in mind here. First of all, that is not saying that that's what happens. This is not a series of equilibrium points. The economy uh, is actually most likely not going to be on the line. It's going to be somewhere else. So this is not a series of equilibrium points like that is. That's a series of equilibrium points. You have to be on that line in a supply and demand diagram because that represents the behavior of consumers. This is simply a set of reference points. This is simply telling us what would the exchange rate have to be in order to generate balanced trade under these circumstances. But as I said, likely as not, we're not going to be there. Um, just by coincidence do we end up on the same place as the green line. Uh, and we want to know this though, because what we're going to do is, out of those four quadrants, this is the bottom left, we're generally going to start on the far right, or on the, on the bottom right, talking about the domestic macro economy, and then the domestic financial uh, um, uh, system, and then the exchange rate, and then by then, we'll, by then we'll have the PY from the graph over here, and we'll have the dollars per FX from the graph up here, and we're just going to bring them together and see where they intersect over here. And if they intersect down here, then that's going to be a U.S. trade, what, surplus? Yeah. And if they intersect up here, it's going to be U.S. trade deficit. And if they intersect on the line, it's going to be U.S. trade balance. So, so we're trying to figure out on the bottom right, hey, what kind of situation is the U.S. in right now? Have they got a U.S. trade deficit or a trade surplus? Uh, and there is absolutely no expectation that the economy ends up on that line. Now, that was different, as I said, in a graph we didn't go over in this class but I did in earlier years. In his bottom left graph, which is showing the trade balance, notice that you moved off it momentarily there over to, a, as I can tell, it looks like it's labeled W. Uh, but he ended, up, he ended up going from F to G ultimately. All right, so he ended up staying on the line and having balanced trade because in the neoclassical view, the only long run position of equilibrium is balanced trade. In the post-Keynesian view, that's not true. Uh, okay, good, yeah. I don't have my glasses on, so to me, what I'm looking at on the monitor is out of focus, but then that's because it's that, I also cannot read underneath where it says the name of the TV. Um, but when I lean forward, I can read it all. Yeah, and if anything, it should be worse right now because it, the, the uh, camera's trying to focus on me. All right, but wait, there's more. When we start manipulating this thing as part of those four quadrants, uh, we're going to talk about an actual exchange rate and a balanced trade exchange rate, which should sound familiar from what we finished up in the previous chapter, on uh, chapter, a exam.
I'm not going to label the whole thing out here, but balance trade exchange rate, and then somewhere out here was going to be the actual exchange rate. Well, this is the same concept. Sorry, it's a little high up there, but it's all in there. Um, it's the same concept here. Uh, and uh, this time, however, we're going to be doing it on a different graph. And I finally, I hope, figured out, because th this has always caused students problems in this class. Um, it, it's a complicated concept. Well, you just got to take your time. Um, you just have to take your time uh, and, and walk through it, which is what I, exactly what I have to do every single time. Okay, dollars per FX. These are not related to each other directly. I was just showing you the example from the previous chapter. PY. Um, okay, here's the line. As a matter of fact, actually, let me erase that and put above it what we will have when this whole thing is together. That curve I told you about, what to me was yesterday, uh, that shows the relationship between U.S. interest rates and the exchange rate. If the U.S. interest rate goes up, then the dollar appreciates and vice versa. Um, we're always going to get, let me see if I can mark this on here. Whatever the actual exchange rate is, it's always coming from up here, all right? So we are finding out what the actual exchange rate is when we carry out the manipulation of this graph right here. We say, oh, it's right here, and then we drop it straight down. So this always comes from this graph, all right? Remember that. That's a, a very helpful piece of advice that I did not think to offer students until relatively recent history. Um, the balanced trade exchange rate is really coming off of over here. And let me jot that down too. Oh, I meant to use blue again. Not that it matters that much, but it matters a little. And P, Y, Z, D. Uh, and yeah. Yeah, I should do the same thing over there with one of them big red arrows, shouldn't I? All right, let's see here. Let me get down over here. What time it is? I'm hungry for lunch already. It's 11. Close enough. Okay. Uh, balanced trade dollars per FX is derived from this, okay? Or I should say here, to be consistent with what I said before. You don't actually get an exchange rate off this graph because what you get is PY off that graph. But you, um, the PY is what you get the balanced trade exchange rate from. Uh, for example, let's say that this is the current PY, PY sub zero. I wonder what the balanced trade exchange rate is. I wonder what the exchange rate would have to be in order for trade to be balanced. That. Because that is, if I may use some French for just a moment, the raison d'etre of the um, BTFX curve. The BTFX curve is showing you where are all the combinations that give you balanced trade. So if US GDP happens to be PY sub zero, we're not going to have balanced trade unless we also happen to have this exchange rate. So notice here then that we don't know what the balanced trade exchange rate is until we know PY sub zero. PY sub zero is the dominant factor here and we get that off of that graph. So for example, if PY sub zero were 
I'm sorry, if PY was, and I'll do PY sub 1 this time. If PY is actually PY sub 1, then the balanced trade exchange rate is dollars per FX sub 1. How do I know that? Because that's the whole freaking point of the curve. That's all that curve is for, is to show you what would the exchange rate have to be if this were US GDP and we wanted balanced trade. That does not mean that's where it's going to be. We don't know where it's going to be. That's going to come down off of here. All right. That's going to come down from up here. The actual exchange rate is going to come down from up here. And it might be, you know, over here, over here, over here, over here, over here. It might, might be anywhere all over that. Down. It, there's, there is no causal relationship between this and this. This doesn't cause anything up there. Now, that's the flipping over the neoclassical view where the trade flows are actually the causal factor. This one's saying, nah, the financial market was. Right, the financial market set the exchange rate, and then we are forced to trade at that exchange rate, uh, and that exchange rate may or may not generate balanced trade, depending on whether or not it corresponds to the current balanced trade exchange rate. Now, notice here uh, that at a higher nominal U.S. GDP, we need a cheaper dollar. And that's right, because at a higher nominal GDP, we've got a lot more money. Um, imports are highly sensitive to income. So when our incomes rise, we not only buy more imports, we buy more than the percentage increase in income. Uh, it tends to be income elastic. All right? uh, and not only that, but if we're up here, then prices may be higher too, which means that that also is going to uh, uh, make it more difficult for us to, to export. So when we go up this way, let's see, I'm going to use purple. When we go up over here, exports are going to fall. Why? Because prices went up, you know, presumably, but it, but potentially, depending on that combination there. Uh, the best case scenario is that prices didn't change at all, but then we've still got the problem of why. And if why is the reason why it went up, well, then we're going to import a lot more. It won't change our exports at all, but we're going to import a lot more. So whether it's P or Y rising here or both, Either way, exports are going to fall. Well, only if P goes up. And M is going to rise. So that's going to lead us into trade deficit territory. Well, what happens down here? A cheaper dollar, which is what you get when you move to the right, is going to increase exports. What you got, buddy? Hey. A tiny, tiny piece of this toy that he has ripped out and is playing with. That's great. Uh, so, a cheaper dollar means higher exports and lower imports. Lower imports, why? Because foreign money is more expensive now, so we're not going to buy as much foreign stuff. Higher exports, why? Because our money is so cheap. So, the only way for trade to stay balanced if nominal GDP rises is if the dollar depreciates. That doesn't mean it will. We're just trying to figure out what must the exchange rate be in order for there to be balanced trade. We get that off of this one. Because what we're doing is we're coming across from PY, we're hitting, bouncing back, and seeing what the balanced trade exchange rate is at that PY. We're asking ourselves, if this is the level of nominal GDP, what would the exchange rate have to be in order to have balanced trade? And unless we know that, unless we know that, let's see, I'm going to draw this up on the top right here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Quantity of pounds. All right. Uh, let's say we know the far right intersection. Demand for dollars, uh, exports US plus capital inflows US. Did all that fit? Yes, it did. And the demand for pounds, imports US plus capital outflows U.S. Okay, so we've got AER. Cool. Does the U.S. have a trade balance or a trade surplus? We don't know. We've got to have BTER. Just because we've got the actual exchange rate, which will drop down from over here, doesn't mean we can tell what the trade balance is. We have to know where that other intersection is. And that other intersection is being driven by the factors that are being modeled down here. That other intersection 
It's absolutely vital to know that. Um, and w we could do this. We could say, you know, well, then let's say that uh, this curve shifts out to here. Now what do we have? I still don't know. I've got to have BTER. There's no way I can figure out the trade deficit or surplus without BTER. So that's why we have to combine those two. Yes! I am actually really excited because we're about to do the four quadrant diagram, three examples thereof. I've given you enough background uh, and um, uh, to be able to go over it all. Uh, but first, I'm going to eat lunch.